everybody, um, my name is Dave Leonard. I'm uh, Head of Business and Operations at Bristol Robotics Laboratory. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this panel discussion to explore the future of robotics. This session brings together leading experts from BRL to share the exciting developments happening in their areas, the future possibilities for robotics, and how this research is relevant in an industry setting. We should have about 20 minutes for questions at the end of the session once panel members have introduced themselves in their areas of research. So please submit questions through the chat section of the, live, of the YouTube live stream. Uh, panelists, uh, please can I invite you to introduce yourselves, provide a brief description of your work, and identify any major challenges you currently face. So uh, no particular order, uh, left to right, uh, Manuel. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back. Um, so uh, my name is Manuel Giuliani. I'm uh, so my official title is uh, Professor for Robotics. Um, sorry, uh, Professor for Cognitive AI um, uh, for Robotics. And uh, uh, so my research area is human robot interaction. Um, and so um, wh why do we need human robot interaction? Um, so basically, all we have this vision of the ubiquitous robot of robots everywhere in the future. Um, and all of these robots need to be able to interact with humans, especially in areas where um, you have robots working together with um, humans who are not trained to use robots. So right now, uh, most robots that are used are, in, for example, in industrial automation. Um, and in industrial automation, you have um, specific trainings for the people who are operating these robots. Um, in the future, when we are using um, robots, for example, in um, in hospitals or robots in your home, um, you will not um, have the specific training that you needed. So, we, so the robot needs to be able to um, interact with the human in a socially sensible way, in a safe way, um, in, a, uh, in a way that's acceptable for the, uh, for the humans. So um, in human-robot interaction, we, um, you know, we, we have two challenges. On the one hand, there's a technical challenge. Uh, challenge. So um, to make robots understand what humans are doing and to understand the, um, the speech that humans are producing, the gestures uh, that humans are producing, the body postures, the facial expressions, um, all of that needs to come together in a quite complicated um, cognitive architecture for robots to understand what humans are doing. Um, so there's a technical challenge there to bring all of that together. And then also for the robot to, 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 to provide feedback um, uh, in, a, in a socially acceptable way is also quite technically, uh, technically, uh, technically challenging. And of course, there's also a, um, a challenge um, to, uh, for the research to look at how humans are then working with the robots and to do uh, um, social, social studies and user studies where we are testing um, how these technical systems that we are building are actually um, rated by um, human participants. And, um, and again, there's a, there's a bandwidth of, um, you know, a uh, wide bandwidth of um, really challenging problems there. For example, what are the, um, what um, are, uh, how, ro how robots can be trusted, how robots can be um, used on a, on a usability level, how um, robots can be uh, um, used on a, on a social level and on a social uh, acceptability level. So, um, so there, there are always to human robot interaction, these two parts, the technical challenge and the um, challenge to work with uh, participants and to make the robots actually acceptable for them. And I'm going to hand over back to you, Dave, now. Okay, thanks, yeah. thanks very much for that, man. Well, uh, if I could hand over now to Sabine Hallett, uh, again, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and providing a brief description of your work and the, the challenges face. Sure, I'm Sabine Howard. I'm Associate Professor of Swarm Engineering at the University of Bristol and Bristol Robotics Laboratory. My team engineers swarms across scales from nanoparticles or micro robots for biomedical applications to robots that are maybe coin sized that work in the hundreds so that we can think about how many robots might work together in the future to larger robots that work in smaller numbers but could be useful in the future in areas like interlogistics or environmental monitoring. Uh, so we build all sorts of different hardware platforms from aerial systems to ground systems to water-based systems to those that go in your body. And we're also exploring how you design the rules that these agents follow so that large numbers of robots, when they work together, they do the right thing. And discovering these rules could be done using machine learning or it could be done using bio-inspiration. Now, what I've noticed is, is that I feel like we've been doing this for a while in the laboratory. We've been coming up with new algorithms to coordinate large numbers of robots. We've been designing new hardware platforms that, works into, that work in different ways. And so we have these capabilities, and I feel like they're ripe. Um, 
in, in a way that we can now move to the real world. We can now start making swarms for people. And that raises all sorts of challenges, right? How do you, how do you um, make these swarms in a way that the users trust them? And actually, we, we've spent a bit of time in the past two years asking potential users of swarm technology what they'd like to see these robots doing. And the first thing that's encouraging is that they didn't go science fiction. There's a real unmet need. You know, if you talk to someone in small retail, you talk to someone who's thinking um, about a warehouse, a pop-up warehouse, they don't know how to deploy robot solutions because that would require upfront cost. It would require infrastructure. And I think swarms have the potential to help us solve this challenge of being, you know, out of the box, something that you can use in, in a ready way. But when we talk to them, they want to know how these swarms would work and how they would be trustworthy. And can we check that it would would make sense in a meaningful way. So moving to the real world is the challenge, but I think we're at a stage where it makes sense. That's great. Thanks very much, Sabine. Uh, and now if I can introduce you to, uh, to Praminda Caleb Solly. Hello, so I'm Praminda Caleb Solly. I'm Professor for Assisted Robotics and Intelligent Healthcare Technologies here at the British Robotics Lab. Uh, and my uh, research area stems from our uh, aging demographic. So uh, it's great that we're all living longer, but unfortunately the incidence of ill health and long-term conditions means that we are not able to achieve the same quality of life that we'd like. And in addition to that, uh, we have a growing shortage of care providers and care staff. On any given day in the UK, um, there are over 100,000 vacancies in adult social care, 40,000 nurses uh, shortage. So we have quite an urgent need to be able to see how technology can be utilized to support uh, people to um, live uh, and support themselves, uh, really. So the work that we've been doing uh, is to look at developing uh, robotic technology solutions that provide support over a range of different care needs. So this could be from social assistance uh, for people with who need cognitive support, so people with early dementia who need step-by-step um, -step guidance in terms of uh, being able to complete activities, as well as people with um, physical impairments as well, so mobility, uh, assistance. So we've been developing technology that can support people with um, getting out of bed and being able to ambulate. And then the challenges, some of them that uh, uh, Manuel's already um, discussed, are to do with um, human-robot interaction. But these are um, even more um, significant because the people who are interacting with these technologies have got a range of sensory and cognitive impairments as well. So for example, somebody who has had a stroke and needs physical assistance might also have problems with communication. Um, so um, they might have what's called neglect, not be able to see from one side, uh, and they might have speech impairments. So if speech impairments are being, uh, speech is being used to interact with a the robot, then that becomes a challenge. Uh, the, what we have been working on in the lab is looking very uh, holistically at these robots, which need to be adaptable and change along with people's changing needs and long-term conditions. What becomes important is, do we have the intelligence sensing that sits alongside these robots, not just within the robots, but within the environment, uh, wearables that the person might have, physiological um, sensing, uh, information about their medication that can all be integrated together so that the assistance that's provided is truly uh, personalized and adaptable. I can go on about this, but one, one key thing that I would uh, like to add in terms of the challenges is it's not just about us engineers developing this technology in the lab. We need to be getting out there at the very early stage of the concept stage and working with the people we're designing the technology for, as well as the experts who are the carers and the clinicians. Because if we're, they're not coming along with us on the journey, then we're not going to be able to achieve anything at all. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Praminda. And then uh, if I can just hand you over to, uh, to Arthur Richards, uh, that'll be great. Arthur, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Hello, everyone. My name is Arthur Richards. I'm a professor of robotics and control. 
uh, and I specialize in autonomous mobility. So trying to build machines that are clever in some sense about how they move uh, and make, are able to make some, some kinds of their own decisions in how they are mobile. So that involves work with drones, with cars, we've looked at trains, we've looked at spacecraft and air traffic. So it's a very widely applicable uh, problem. Um, and in terms of challenges, um, there's an obvious one about safety, and I think there's a lot of other talks today about safety, so I won't, um, I won't go into that one in detail. But the two I'd really like to highlight, um, first of all, is to do with a, a sort of system setting, to do with the broader systems and infrastructure that support um, mobile robots, indeed all kinds of robots. If you think about what makes the roads work, it's not just the cars, it's the signs, the lines, the training, the maintenance, the same for air traffic, um, the same for uh, trains, and th that kind of level of infrastructure that makes a whole system do its job is not something we often think about in the sense of just getting a single robot to be mobile. And I think in some cases, it suggests that we can we can exploit infrastructure that's there. So for example, on the roads, there's a lot of stuff that you can start to use already, but is that the right infrastructure? If we're moving towards more automated driving, do we need changes in that? In the case of drones, uh, we don't really have anything and people are working very hard to understand what might be needed to have that. So it's kind of interesting to, to ask the questions if you're starting from a blank sheet, what kind of architecture do you want for that? You know, do we want uh, people with you know, centralized control offices? Do we need to construct some kinds of sort of air-based road signs? What does an aerial traffic light look like? There are a lot of big unanswered questions as soon as you start thinking beyond just the vehicle and things in the system. The second challenge I'd like to highlight is the role of the human in this. Uh, and this is when we talk about, oh, I'm going to automate driving a vehicle or flying an aircraft. Um, that's often only one of the roles of uh, of the pilot or the driver at the moment. Human drivers can provide uh, community services in some places in sense of its vital connection for people whose only human contact all week is to get the bus. The bus drivers have been known to save people's lives through the first aid that they've given them. And when we say, oh, I'm gonna automate the driving of the bus, we really do just mean getting it to go in the right direction. And the same is true in a lot of cases where we're automating mobility. So I think we need a much more uh, thoughtful conversation about how the role of humans and the positive of human workers is gonna evolve as we introduce these technologies. That's all from me. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, again, if I could uh, invite uh, the audience to submit questions, uh, that would be fantastic. I, I see there isn't any at the moment, but uh, I've got a couple already, so, um, so, so that's good news. Um, the, the first thing I'm gonna say is quite clearly, we've identified lots of, of potential challenges, um, but, um, but what are the opportunities that exist for robotics? Uh, Manuel? What are the opportunities? Uh, well, I mean, I think one of the major opportunities that I see is that um, robots are there that could, can be used to support humans in their tasks. Um, so I, um, I very much think that we shouldn't replace humans um, with robots, um, especially in, you know, in the care sector. Um, but I mean, the Praminda's example is a really good one. Um, so there's a, there's a shortage of um, staff in the care sector and in the, um, in the NHS, for example. Uh, like if we could, for example, um, automate uh, a task like transportation tasks in hospitals or automate tasks like uh, changing linens of beds. Um, or, so uh, in order to support the staff in these sectors so that they, the staff has, has more time to actually take care of patients and to actually take care of um, people in care homes. So that's, that's an absolute opportunity, if you ask me, um, so that you... Um, yeah, so that you use the robotics technology to, to support the human and not to replace. Maybe, uh, do, you, do you want to add yeah. to that? I mean, you have more, much more to say to that, I think. I, 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 yeah. I totally agree. And, yeah. and also, um, in terms of how we are offering that support to people, it is about being able to empower them and to do something more. So I always think about technology. It's a tool you can, you know, what you're capable of doing, but what else will you be able to achieve as a result of that? Uh, and, you know, we are uh, creative. We're always looking at new ways to improve lives. And we've got big uh, challenges in terms of climate change, etc. And so, um, for example, if we've got, um, um, say, a retired engineer who has got years and years of experience to be able to bring to the table to 
address some of these challenges. And if we've used the robotics technology to be able to, for example, use it uh, in a telepresence way, so that person might not be able to go out of their home, but can still be present within an environment where they are still contributing, to me, that is the one of the key benefits that we can offer. There's also, I think, an opportunity on the technology side. So the, the way we're wrapping our head around the deployment of many robot systems is, is by combining the, the cyber and the physical world, because now we have the ability to create um, simulations that are either high fidelity so that we have a good mimic uh, of the real world or that are low fidelity so that we can do machine learning and run loads and loads of experiments before we deploy them. And new test beds that are, that are quite sophisticated in terms of the robots that we can design nowadays um, that, that make it realistic to test these things in the physical world. So I think that marrying up of, of both the digital and the physical and testing them in test beds is also something that we're trying to do on, on the swarm side. Uh, I think there's not much left for me to say in a way. No, I mean, but just to highlight a few things I like that. I mean, I, I love the way that, Perinda, you pulled out the idea of robotics should be tools to make us better. I think that's pivotal. And I think, so I, I think there's a clear thing with apologies today for not answering the question, but what the opportunity is not is just saving money by putting robots where humans are. The op opportunity is to make humans more productive and more effective in filling some of those, not, not filling those vacancies, but in perhaps making more of the people that we do have who are, who are working in the care sector. And I think um, I'm, I'm a big, big believer in the dull, dirty, dangerous. It's a kind of an old fashioned concept, but I think it hasn't gone away. And I think we need to focus our efforts on things that, that uniquely, uh, where, where we can uniquely make a difference by using robots as tools. Um, I think, you know, we don't work on flying drones through volcano plumes to understand what's going on in the earth. You know, there's no way you'd be able to do that any other way. Um, we're talking, uh, I'm trying to think about what other, you know, um, you know, going to the very depths of the ocean to understand or going out into space. There's, you know, so I think we have to hold the bar really high for the dull, dirty, dangerous. So things like safety implications of working at height, working in radiation, you know, those are very skilled jobs. So they're still going to have humans who are sort of driving these technologies. But it's about making more of those humans and keeping them also away from these environments that are really just uniquely bad for us. Okay, well, thanks for that answer. I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, we've had quite a, a flurry of, uh, of questions coming in through now. So uh, the first one is from Rob Condit Pratt. Um, how concerned are you by the amount of announcement at the end of the production of Pepper, and what does this say about the future of social robotics? That's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, so on the one hand, so, I mean, yeah, Pepper, Pepper has been a really useful platform for social robotics research because it's uh, quite, uh, well, it's a good platform. You know, it's, it's open, you have the software, it's, it's easy to, um, to, um, to uh, prepare user studies with it. Um, the, you know, so, so, so that's, a, that's a good thing about Pepper. Pepper is, at the, on the other hand, uh, well, it has a certain form factor, of course. So, um, so if you want to study other um, form factors of, of robots, um, then uh, then you need to find another platform or build your own. So um, so in, in one hand, it Pepper enabled a lot of social robotics research, and but also restricted it because it has this very particular form factor. It's very cute, you know. It's uh, it's very it's a bit childlike and so on. So so it's so it's not it's not the perfect robot for all um, social robotics research. So, um, but still I'm, you know, it's, it's sad to see that soft robotics, um, soft bank robotics has, um, has decided to, um, to close down the pepper uh, production because it has been a really useful platform for the research in the, uh, in the past um, seven years since 2014, since it was um, uh, uh, introduced. So, um, but, I mean, this is a general thing. It's, it's quite hard for new companies or for companies in general to, um, to launch new product, uh, robotics product um, and make it, make it a successful uh, business. So, um, and I see <laughs> from in this <laughs> also itching to, um, to say something. Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, over to yeah. you from in there. Yeah. To, to me, it illustrates actually two things we should be quite cautious about, mm -hmm. uh, particularly from where I'm sitting in the use of these as potential aids in uh, helping people in the home. And one of them is, you know, the, the volatility of these uh, technologies that emerge and uh, how one might become over dependent on them and then they disappear and support for them disappears. And also the fact that there are only a few organizations who are developing these technologies and then they decide 
it doesn't fit into their business model and the rest of us are left. So I think it's, uh, it's a really good lesson in how we um, integrate and, and use these. Uh, and uh, the other point I think is a good learning lesson is the complexity of these technologies and the fact that um, safety, as you've been mentioning, Arthur, is, doesn't come cheap. You know, um, you have to develop redundancy into these systems. These are systems which are going to learn and adapt uh, to their changing environments, and that costs money. And people have to be aware that you don't do that on the cheap. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that's something else for us, I think, as a lesson learned. So um, I've uh, enjoyed using the Pepper platform. Uh, it's helped, like uh, Manuel said, to help us to learn several aspects of... Um, we integrated the Pepper platform with our smart home sensors, um, and we've been looking to see how it can provide task prompting. And we've actually found um, that it's a really good platform for that. Uh, it's engaging and people respond to it um, and yeah I, I think um, in terms of taking the field forward and uh, we have learned quite a lot from it. Thank you very much if I can move on to the next question I can see that there's two that are actually quite similar one from Chris Harper and, uh, and one from Virginia um, so I just want to ask uh, this is probably aimed more at, uh, at, at Sabine actually but um, very much looking at the implication of, of robotics and AI on levels of employment and jobs in society. Um, how does the panel see how society would adapt to this? And similarly, Virginia was asking about the question of are robots taking jobs or humans doing robotic jobs? So uh, often when we do these types of panel discussions, we ask the public if they work with robots yet uh, in their daily life or if they live with robot technologies that are being used on a regular basis. And most of them say no. I think. We're still at a stage where robots are meant to, to work on specific tasks, not whole jobs. And so I, I think we need to think carefully about what we want those tasks to be. So thinking about what Arthur said before, we have the, the control and the power to decide to a certain extent where we think these are useful. Now, in, in the era of intralogistics, warehouses, that's an area where you might feel like there's, there's a potential displacement and there is a potential displacement. I think we can't um, hide behind that fact and we need to be really conscious of what skills we need to give the, the people who work in those environments so that they can work with the technology um, going forward. But in our user case studies, um, the small retail, the pop-up warehouses, they, there was an unmet need. There was a thing that they didn't have the capability to do currently that someone was stuck doing, maybe spending days of their, of their week trying to do inventory, trying to count things, trying to check that things aren't going back the back of their food shop. Um, and those are things where they would like help, like this is what they're telling us. So I think these areas of unmet need are not necessarily areas of displacement, or if they are displacement, they're positive displacement, because um, they're, they're allowing people to do things that they care about. So it's, it's going to be an ongoing conversation, and I think we need to keep having these questions so that we, re we reassess on a regular basis. Excellent. Arthur, would you like to, to add any questions? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I agree with what's been said, and I think, I think all of us have I think all of us have sort of quite strongly pled in a way that we just don't, we, we just need to think about this in much, much more subtle and, and thoughtful terms. Um, and I think it's really, it's really counterproductive for, for us in robotics research, but also for us in the world to think about robotics or robots as a kind of mechanical analog for humanity. Robots are, robots are tools. They, you know, they can't do what we do. They don't need to do what we do because we already have humans. And I think, um, I, I think there's, you know, I, I, I could be persuaded either way on this because other, other people have pointed out that we do live in a society that is fundamentally unfair and unjust and, just, and doubtless there will be opportunities for people to come in and take a simplistic view on this and say, brilliant, you know, if I automate that, then I can sack all these people and save a fortune. I'm sure we will see a case of that, but I suspect that will go horribly wrong. I think when you get up close and personal with robots as we do you know, daily, you start to understand their strengths and weaknesses much better and as that knowledge and understanding becomes ubiquitous as we like to say i think we'll have a different relationship and we'll understand that that's short-sighted um, but i think as sabine said you know there's this sort of rather sort of nasty euphemism of displacement i think it will happen because it's going to pay some people to make it happen in the short term but i think long term i think we'll just be moving to a different relationship with our with smarter tools 
Thanks very much, Arthur. I think there's lots of food for thought there, and I think the, uh, this conversation could go on for, for, for many, many hours. Um, the, the, the next question is, is very much aimed at Praminda from Steve Glanville, which is, in terms of assisted living robots for the elderly, what work will need to be done to help the person to not become reliant on the robot, especially for robots that will support them emotionally? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I think um, we've been exploring that, and uh, this is where the point Arthur was making as well is important. We uh, need to be um, aware that the human, the person in the loop, has certain abilities and is you're not looking to replace it. So, for example, we started to explore this really early on with one of our, um, our European projects, Mobisurf, which was just because you've got a robot there doesn't mean it can it will need to do all the tasks. So, for instance, telling it to switch the light off rather than uh, get you going and getting that little bit of movement and exercise and circulation to go and switch the light off yourself. Um, and I think we need to rethink um, the way humans have evolved, we've uh, evolved to conserve energy. Um, so if there is an option to do something an easier way, then we'll become lazy. Uh, and so that is always a danger <laughs> of that happening. But that's just, you know, how, how, how things are. Um, so we've got to be quite... Um, I think um, respectful of maintaining human dignity and um, what and, and maintaining human skill and creativity as well. You know, so being able to work collaboratively with the system, keep the person in the loop. So, for example, uh, perception, as you said earlier on, Manuel, is really complex task for a machine. But you've got the person sitting there in, a, in, in their home and they can see that there is some, an obstacle down there and if it moves a bit to the left, so why not include them in that uh, working with the robot? So they are there involved and engaged, uh, thinking about what's happening. Uh, and, and that to me is the way to um, not uh, become subservient, if you like, and sit back and let the robot do everything for you. Okay, um, thank you very much. I know we're, we're, we're just about um, well, approaching the end of the time, so um, I, there's several questions that, we, that, that uh, maybe if I can just go for, for one final question uh, from, um, from Naya uh, Ahmed. What is the current status of commercial mobile robotics, fourth industrial revolution for cyber physical systems, and what is going well? Gosh, that's probably me, isn't it? I mean, that's... That... <laughs> Squeeze in a last question and make it four in one question. Why don't you? Uh, what is the current state? I mean, I think this, I think the state is quite the state is quite public. I think we have early stage, you know, uh, certainly in terms of autonomous driving, we have early stage capabilities in in uncontrolled environments. But I think those things are showing. I mean, you know, you jump on YouTube, you can see how limited they are in effectiveness. So we're just starting to understand the problems in terms of autonomous public mobility. Um, in terms of controlled environments, we're actually really, really good. You can buy products that will go straight into factories and warehouses and will move lots of stuff around. Um, we think there's room to make those more scalable, which is the work that we're doing, that Sabine's doing, and that we're involved in as well. Um, so I think there's room to do better as we try and do more of that, but there's certainly sort of good good products available. And I would say that's kind of a, the, you know, the controlled environment work is, is, is you know, I'm reluctant to say done, but it, it's mature. Um, cyber physical, I think, is a bigger question again. I mean, so there's probably as many interpretations of that as there are people in the room. Um, I think that's very early days. So I think it's a really big opportunity um, because we know, you know, we we know about uh, you know, what I'm loosely going to bag as cyber technologies, cloud, and concerns about cyber security and edge, uh, and lots of capabilities to draw them together. Um, but I don't think we've really bottomed out how those are going to play with robots yet. We can see that there's potential. We can also see that there's enormous hazards. It's time for us to start exploring you know, how does the tech work and also what do we want to achieve with that? So I would say that that, that part of that question is, is very, it's, it's a start of a discussion now. That's great. And, and actually, I feel incredibly guilty if I didn't ask um, a question on behalf of Helen Manchester. Actually, she submitted two questions. Uh, and I noticed we do have about a minute left. So, um, so Helen uh, asks, what kind of interdisciplinary and cross-sectoral collaborations do you feel are necessary in building fair human robot futures? Well, 
I, I would say for assistive robots, you know, I couldn't uh, move ahead without a range of different disciplines, um, going from um, care, clinical, um, social health. But there's also things that seem to get missed out, which are around aesthetic design. So, you know, we've got a big emphasis on STEM uh, and part of what we're missing out or might be in a danger of missing out is on the arts, uh, making these systems which are um, a delight to own, uh, a joy to have around you. Uh, so I think having uh, artists and uh, creatives and also thinking more creatively about uh, being able to bring in uh, maybe music and, and uh, other kinds of uh, you know, opportunities that uh, could be offered. Um, of course, you've got to think about legal aspects. I'm, 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 I think we are really behind in not bringing the legal professionals with us on the journey as we develop these um, technologies um, as well. So those are two, two key areas, but of course, we couldn't do assistive robotics without an interdisciplinary team. And, and uh, I think that's part of the fun of robotics is it's so, so interdisciplinary. So, so people in, in all of our teams come from so many different disciplines and that's really important. And I think we can also connect to what's state of the art in other areas of science. So whether it's material sciences to make new robots that are greener or that are softer, that, you know, that are built in very, very different ways that might be biodegradable. I think there's, there's just a lot of opportunity for others who are not thinking of robots to come in and tell us how, how they can uh, work with us. Yeah, I mean, from I mean, already um, said a lot. Um, so all the humanities, basically, we need all of them, you know, psychology, sociology, uh, uh, you know, why not look at um, history as well and, uh, and, and, and think like linguistics. Uh, I, I myself, I, you know, I'm a trade computational linguist, for example, I, you know, it had nothing to do with robotics before I came into this field. So, um, so there's a lot there's a lot that we need from from other um, research areas yeah thank you and if i could just have a final comment from from arthur okay uh yeah i mean we've got a we've got a great laundry list there and i think that that's a, so I, I would just add a couple to i mean i've i've had some great conversations with a philosopher recently who's just kind of persuaded me that i don't know what i'm talking about which is vitally important um i, I love history i think the idea that you know that there are there's a very um, there's a lot we can learn about how other technologies and you know people say there's nothing new under the sun and I think we like to talk about robotics as if it's unprecedented it's new and I think that risks walking away from it and then I think um, politics with a small p which I think is is sort of the domain of, of sociology to a certain extent and there's a lot of thinking starting in the lab at the moment about well who owns robotics which is a weird way of putting it but you know there is a feeling that you know tech brings the money so tech calls the shots and I think that's dangerous um, and I think that's something which you know we in research but in all levels of, of engaging with this technology and funding and, and, in, um, and in government and in, in regulation is something we need to engage with so uh, we need we need a lot and there's some more to think about as well absolutely very very exciting times ahead so uh, on that conclusion thank you very much to the panelists very much appreciate it and uh, and the audience thank you for, uh, for watching and also uh, sending in your comments uh, much appreciated. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.